Well, good morning. It is a privilege to be able to bring God's word to you this morning. Thank you so much to Christy and the worship team for leading us in celebration this morning of our Lord and Savior. It's wonderful to be able to take the Lord's Day and focus on the Lord, make it all about Him. We just came through the Christmas season, and I hope that it was a Merry Christmas for you and for your family. I know our family enjoyed being able to have some time together just as a family and celebrate the Christmas season. And of course, when you're a parent with young kids, one of the fun things about Christmas is the gifts. You just, you can't and the excitement to see what's going to be there. And I hope that each one of you got great gifts for Christmas. If you didn't, I think there's still some sales going on, so just go on and go ahead and go get yourself something, and uh, hopefully you didn't spend all your Christmas budget. But, you know, as Christians, it's one of the wonderful things. We, we never have to worry about uh, getting the ring up on Facebook. I'd be glad to add you into that group and share in that experience of reading through the entirety of God's Word in a year. I, I think it's so important. It's important to take time for personal Bible study, but it's also so important to be a part of a church where God's Word is expounded and His truth is revealed in meaningful ways. And so I hope that can be our experience together this morning as we're going to be looking at John chapter 2, verse 1 to 11. Now before I, I jump into the text and we unpack the meaning of that text this morning, I want to set the stage a little bit for how we might receive this message in relation to our current context. I'm grateful to be able to bring this message. And I don't think that I would be wrong to say that I believe most of us are hoping that uh, this year will be a little better than last year. I'm a person who likes to set goals. And let me say, it didn't take very long into 2020 for my goals to get severely changed. Now, I don't personally feel that 2020 was a complete write-off. There were a lot of things I learned. There was some great new experiences I had, but it, it was very different than anything that I thought it was going to be or that I could have planned on. But I think if there's one thing that stood out to me in my mind from 2020, it is In the grand scheme of things, troll, but God still is. And as I approach a new year with optimistic hope for the future, I'm challenged to align that hope not with anything that I can accomplish alone, but to anchor my hope in the one who's already accomplished everything that I ultimately need. Now, I can't tell you that in any physical way your 2021 is going to be better than 2020. That's our hope, that's our desire. But I can tell you what God's Word tells us, and that is that Jesus Christ came to make all things new. And the passage we're going to look at today is a, a beautiful reminder of how Jesus came to turn our devastation into celebration. And as we walk through this well-known story that we're going to see, I pray that each one of us is going to be able to embrace the message that is there of transformation, which leads to glorification, as we've been singing this morning, to the greatest gift giver ever. And the story is the miracle at Cana where Jesus turned water into wine. And so if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to that passage, John chapter 2, verse 1 to 11, and follow along as I read. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. 
And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. It's the word of the Lord. I've had the privilege of officiating quite a number of weddings during my time in pastoral ministry. However, this scenario has never been one that I've encountered, running out of wine. It might have been beneficial in a few instances, but it was never actually the case. I have, however, run into a few wedding hiccups that might have given a bit of a slight perspective on this first century celebration and the problems that were encountered there. The first wedding I ever did was an outdoor wedding that was overlooking the Peace River. Beautiful location, very thoughtfully chosen, but uh, the thought behind it kind of lost a little bit of its feel, a little bit of its romantic nature due to the circumstances. As is the case with outdoor weddings, the weather is always a factor. Sometimes it's rain, sometimes it's wind. In this situation, it was the heat. And though we don't get a lot of really hot days in the peace country, this day was a scorcher. It was well over 30 degrees Celsius. And the only way for guests and those participating in the wedding to get to the venue was to uh, arrive there by horse-drawn wagon. Now that seems really charming, but following a couple big dark horses who are pulling Wagon after wagon in the scorching sun pretty soon changes from charming to stinking really quickly. And here you have all these finely dressed people looking forward to this day, and then they get the smells of these animals sort of wafting back over them. And then on top of that, the groom and groomsmen had been designated to arrive at the venue at the spot a couple hours beforehand to set up the chairs for the guests and to put a few other decorative items in place. And so they were sitting out under the sun. There was virtually no shade there. And besides the heat, the clothes that they'd worn for that day weren't very conducive to the occasion. I remember I felt bad. I showed up. I'm like, it's a hot day. I'm just going to wear a short sleeve shirt with a tie. These poor guys had their cowboy boots, their Wrangler Jeans, they had long sleeve shirt, vest, full suit jacket, cowboy hat, and they're working away in this sun. And the groom, who already was nervous about the whole thing, didn't like being in front of people, was, was anxious about it, was just sweating buckets. Not the most comfortable position to be in as you're preparing to receive your bride. Well, Jesus encounters a wedding that's taking a, a turn for the worse as well. See, a Jewish wedding during his time would have been designated and designed, put together to be this grand celebration. There wasn't any special wedding organizers. It was the family's job to make this event memorable. The whole experience was a family ordeal. Everybody would have been involved. Everyone would have taken very serious responsibility to see that this occasion would not be forgotten. It wasn't just something that was special for the couple. It had meaning and significance for the pride of the entire family. 
And so the situation that Jesus finds himself in has the potential to be a terribly embarrassing experience. The family had done something unthinkable. They'd failed to provide for their guests. And something like this could have left a mark against the couple and their family for a long, long time. But it's no coincidence that Jesus ends up at this wedding, nor that he ends up interacting with it as he did. John records this story for some very meaningful reasons, which I believe we can unpack as we work through the passage this morning. And before we dig into the passage, there's a few things that are helpful to understand. We need to remember that stories of Jesus' miracles weren't just simply told to recount these incredible things that he did. There's symbolism being conveyed in these stories as well. Anybody who's drove throughout the Peace region this past summer likely encountered various levels of road construction. Our kids are always commenting, it just seems like it doesn't matter where you turn, there's a new road being built or an old road being fixed. And what lets us know that these projects are happening? There's signs. As we get closer to the construction, we see signs telling us to slow down, to use caution, to pay attention to the hazards that we're going to confront. Well, much of what is built into the miracle stories of Jesus also act like symbols or signs calling us to pay attention, to be alert to What is being said because if we move too quick, we might miss it. For example, in the miracle that we're looking at, the situation of this wedding party running out of wine, it could symbolize the way that first century Jews had run out of spiritual refreshment. Wine itself was a sign of joy and God's blessing, something that had been lost to many of God's people as they'd given themselves to a a false understanding of God's plan for them. God wanted to bless His people just as was expressed in Proverbs 3 verse 10, then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. But instead of realizing God's good plan for them, the people had become focused on the law and ritual and frustrated with their general lot in life under the oppression of the Roman rulers. Another aspect of this passage that alludes to that wrong mentality of the Jews was in in verse 4 where Jesus says that His time had not yet come. See, the people were stuck in their anticipation of what they expected and hoped for in a Messiah. They were longing for somebody who'd be a a ruler, a warrior who would fight for them to restore to them their national identity, their spiritual city, their previous status in the world. And the Messiah did come. In fact, He was among them. But at this point in His life, Jesus isn't yet ready to fully reveal to ill-prepared people His humble and yet powerful work of final redemption. And then as we will see, this miracle as a whole is a sign which points towards the revolutionary way Jesus would come to be seen as the Messiah, sent by God. Verse 11 tells us that this was the first of Jesus' miracles. And, And this miracle, along with many others that Jesus performed, would be seen as signs which pointed to His identity as the Messiah. The Messiah who is the Son of God. The Messiah who leads unbelievers to faith. And the Messiah who reveals His glory. Meets our Can we understand what they're telling us? And can we respond? Let's carry on as there's more to discover. 
If we'd go back to John chapter 1, we'd notice that John has a theme that when you read the rest of the book, you'd recognize as a thread, a common, a common thread running through it. And that theme is that Jesus is making things new. In chapter 1, John pointed to Jesus as the original creator. John chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And now in chapter 2, John is showing that Jesus is the new creator. First part of chapter 2, verse 1, tells us that this wedding happened on the third day. And that might seem insignificant, but scholars would call our attention to the importance of that little note made by John about the day. Through chapter 1, there's a series of sequential references to days, and if we would assess the sequence through the lens of how Jews viewed days, we'd see that this event in chapter 2, verse 1, comes at the end of one week and the beginning of a new one. And just as Jesus was the original creator who set things in motion, He now is being revealed as the recreator, come to take that which has gone old and distorted and recreate to produce something new and something glorious. There's two things I want us to notice as we look at how Jesus began this recreating at the beginning of His ministry. One is that Jesus transforms the situation. And we see this presented in verses 1 to 10 where John tells us what happened. Two, we see that Jesus displayed His glory as identified in verse 11, as John could be asking, do we understand what happened? So what did happen? How how did Jesus transform the situation? Well, quite simply, He took the opportunity to, in a very practical way, show His compassion for people. I've talked about the signs of this miracle, and we're going to explore that more, but We also can't forget that at a very basic level, this story was about people that were in trouble and how Jesus helped them. The wedding couple and their family had a problem, and Jesus had a resolution. This miracle, as well as others recorded in the Gospels, should convince us that Jesus is the embodiment of our gracious, loving Heavenly Father who cares for us, even at a practical level. Now, it would seem that Mary had a sense of the physical power of her divine Son, which is why she brings the issue to Jesus' attention even in the first place. And though I want to explain the meaning behind how Jesus responds to Mary a little later, I still think it's fair to acknowledge that to our ears it's a very strange and a a jarring response. Who just calls their mother woman? None of us would get away with that. It seems rude, but Jesus does it. It doesn't seem to phase Mary. And she goes ahead and she directs the servants to carry out the logistics of whatever Jesus instructs them. And so Jesus gives his instructions, and the servants follow through. They fill these six stone jars to the top with water. And then in case anybody's wondering, is there some kind of trickery going on, some kind of deception, the servants draw out what they understand to be water And they bring it over to the master of the feast. And here, the one who, if anybody is going to be able to tell the difference between water and wine, it's going to be this guy. And he is surprised 
to taste not only wine, but excellent wine at that. This wedding has been saved. Why? Because Jesus was present. Jesus transformed the situation from sadness to gladness. You can only imagine the spirit of the people who were gathered together when they recognized what had happened. The renewed joy. And I would hope for most people this would be enough. The the creator of the universe caring about personal hurts and struggles and ambitions. He is our empathetic and compassionate king. It's amazing. But there's more that Jesus wants to reveal. It's an interesting thing to notice and that, that, that is that this miracle is not actually called a miracle. There's a lot of other amazing stories in the Gospels of miracles or works of power or wonders, and they're identified as such throughout the Gospels. But in this story, John simply refers to this experience as a sign. And as I mentioned, John wants us to see the signs. And again, if there's a sign, then the reasonable question can be, what is it a sign of? What does it point to? What is a sign? For those who have eyes to see the glory of Christ, and when they see His glory, they're drawn to Him, and they have faith in Him, just as the disciples did. And so thus, in the first 10 verses of John 2, we see how Jesus transformed the situation as John tells us what happened. And then in verse 11, John tells us that through this event, Jesus displayed His glory. Now, to get the full sense of this, we can't just know what happened. We also need to understand what happened in this story. For those who are Christians or those who are exploring Christianity, it's not enough to know what we believe, but also why we believe it. In today's story, we understand there's an incredible miracle. But why is this miracle significant? What comes down to how it points to God's glory made evident in Jesus. Remember again the strange way that Jesus responds to His mother. He refers to Mary as woman. And there's a clue in that one word that begins to direct our understanding of what Jesus is about to do, which helps us to understand His display of glory. John knew what was going on. He's familiar with Scripture. And he knew that if we would go back to the beginning, we would find a reference to a woman and her son. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. The context of this verse is the Garden of Eden. And the situation is the sin committed by Adam and Eve. And the consequence is separation from God, death. But in Genesis 3.15, we find a promise. The woman will have an offspring who will crush the serpent. And then throughout the rest of Scripture, there's another thread that could be followed which points to the promise of what Jesus would come to do. He would confront the powers of darkness. He would deliver people from Satan. He would come as the promised seed of the woman. And thus the term Jesus uses here in John 2 is related to the promise God had given in Genesis 3. Mary as His mother is the woman, the bearer of the seed. 
but it's not His time for the full extent of this promise to be revealed yet. Now, Mary knows that He is the promised Savior, and so drawing on His identity as the promised deliverer, she prompts Him towards providing deliverance, at least in their current situation. The next thing to notice that helps us to understand what happened is to pay attention to the detailed description of the water jars. Verse 6, John 2, Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. These are large water jars, and they had a very specific purpose. These were jars used for ritual cleansing. This wasn't cleansing like taking a bath type of cleansing, but rather the cleansing for personal inner purification. And to the Jews, this ritual which had been passed on from the time of Moses was critical for the possibility of them being able to sit in the presence of God. And then there's the number of jars that John recounts. It was six jars. To a Hebrew, six was not complete. Seven was the complete number. And so the six here points to the incompleteness of water cleansing. Moses had been God's servant to reveal the law. Law which called the people to purity. But simply following after the law was going to be incomplete. It could not provide final inner cleansing. Again, the law was but a sign pointing to that which would give the people complete joy and purity and the ability to enter into the greatest banquet in God's kingdom to have eternal life. What the water jars cannot do, Jesus does. The law is incomplete, but Jesus is complete. And Paul states the amazing truth of this reality in Romans chapter 8, verse 3 to 4. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. To understand the relevance of this for us today, we should see that our efforts, our work, the things that we try to do can't bring us cleansing. Just as the law was incomplete, our works, our own human efforts are incomplete. But that's the beauty of what John is wanting us to understand in this story. In verse 10, the master of the feast who tastes this wine says, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you've kept the good wine until now. This is exactly what God did. He saved the best for last. First, He introduced the law, which pointed people to their need for a Messiah. And then He provided the Messiah. Law, then grace. And in Jesus, this is what we receive. This is what we experience. Richness, fullness, one blessing after another. In a wonderful way, through these 11 verses, we, we have the gospel in a water jar. You see the sign of what the story is pointing to. It is to Jesus, the Deliverer, to Jesus, 
the perfect, complete one, able to provide cleansing for us when the law and our works fall short. And finally, the sign points to Jesus who provides us fullness and blessing that we probably won't fully comprehend until the day we get to enter the greatest banquet ever put on for us in heaven. I know that we are all looking for things to be made new. We, we want to change. We want relief. But are we looking for it in the right way? And are we looking for it from the right place? We have a Savior who wants to transform and renew us. And what He offers is far greater than any vaccine, any stimulus package. And my question is, have you believed? As the disciples did in Jesus, whose glory and whose goodness far outshines any other. He's the only one who can provide perfect hope for tomorrow and for eternity. My desire is that you would believe in this giver of hope. And then I trust that your life as well can become a sign pointing to the one who came to be the Savior of many. If you haven't been transformed by Jesus and recognize His glory in your life, I pray that you'd allow the Holy Spirit to open your eyes to see the richness and the fullness of God's grace and goodness offered to you. You drink completely from Him today. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19 to 20. And my God will supply every need of yours according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let me pray.